On October the 6th, 1981, during a military parade, President Sadat was assassinated. This had all the trappings of a hero's farewell as Egypt paid its last respects to its assassinated president. Never has the Western world mourned the third world leader as deeply and as publicly as it mourned for President Sadat. Today's ceremony belongs to the Egyptian leaders and to dignitaries from 80 foreign countries. The mourners were led by Sadat's son Gamal. Vice His funeral President procession was attended by most of the Western leaders, and it was followed step by step on television by millions throughout the world. Chancellor Schmidt and French President Mitterrand were among the dignitaries behind them. The American delegation, including former presidents Carter, Ford, and Nixon, was in the back of the group of mourners, surrounded by Secret Service agents. Israeli Prime Minister Begin walked in the middle of the security flanked by former presidents Ford, Carter, and Giscard d'Estaing of France. The commentators reported it was a Western funeral, and they all wondered, where were the Egyptians? Cairo is calm today, surprisingly, extraordinarily calm. There's no great display of troops in the streets. The transition of power here at the parliament building seemed to go smoothly, and on the streets of Cairo itself. The people show none of the emotion that might be expected on the morrow of one of the nation's greatest tragedies. The actual moment when President Sadat set foot on Israeli soil and... Sadat's greatest moment, November 1977, his visit to Jerusalem. ...excitement and disbelief that what such a short time ago would have been unthinkable had happened. The Western world, thirsty for heroes, looked on in fascination at this extraordinary man who'd broken with the past and now dared go and speak of peace. Bismillah. Sayyid, Rais al -Knesset. It seemed he was everybody's hero. President Sadat came home to a tremendous welcome from his people. And even accepting that the Egyptian government had carefully orchestrated much of it, it was obvious many, many thousands of people were showing their true feet. President Sadat concluded his historic 43-hour mission to Jerusalem this afternoon and flew back here to Cairo to a welcome by perhaps a million of his people greeting him like a conquering hero. But the peace he talked about meant different things in different parts of the world. For the West, it was an end in itself, a visionary act of a man who dared step across a gulf which had separated two nations. For Egyptians, it meant something more specific. It was a promise of a better life. We have been isolated from the wireless technology and know-how for more than 20 years and so. Uh, for that, uh, I think peace pays for all of us. The promissory note was a huge one in the face of the realities. In 1977, Egypt was a nation of 38 million people, and it was increasing by more than a million every year. His country, poor in resources, burdened with illiteracy, wrecked by wars, its former alliance with the Soviet Union discredited. Sadat had to find some quick solutions for the desperate crises of his country. President Sadat came to power in 1970. He gradually began to put his own stamp on the Egyptian political landscape. He initiated four new policies which represented a major departure from Nasser. These were the open door policy, i.e. more capitalist development, or encouragement of the private sector alongside with the public sector. Second policy was democratization. The third policy was reconciliation with Israel. And the fourth policy was alignment with the West, especially the United States. Now, these four policies, to be sure, were all welcomed in the beginning by most Egyptians in the hope that they will work, that they will solve Egyptian problems, that they will raise the standard of living, that will make the majority more prosperous. 
Sadat's open door policy opened up Egypt to the world market. Alongside the import of necessary foodstuffs, there was a sudden unrestricted flood of consumer goods, some of which competed with Egypt's own industries like cotton, others luxury goods which only very few could afford. It created a new class of rich middlemen and allowed many of the old landowning families who'd lost their wealth under NASA to re-emerge in a new guise as entrepreneurs. My grandfather was very, very rich. Uh, during the 60s, everything was nationalized. My father was even prohibited to work. So uh, he went to Saudi Arabia and he started all over again. After the open door policy, we returned and I think now we're even much, much bigger than uh, before the 60s. Shimel, put. I'm known here in Egypt uh, now as Mr. BMW, uh, but uh, really it's not my only business. You see, BMW is uh, maybe the, the most famous. I have also other businesses. Tudor, the biggest photo finishing lab in the Middle East. And I am now the sole importer for the Javia air conditioning. I have a contracting company and I have an automatic tile factory. I'm making my new advertising agency and then I have uh, an artificial marble factory. I made it in three years. You don't simply become westernized because you buy motor cars from the West. And this is the real problem of the Sadat period. There was the idea, <clears throat> the principle itself was good. The open door policy was good. But uh, it lacked vigilance, and it was run by people who only understood uh, free trade as meaning um, making money. The open door policy, uh, of course, harmed a great deal the, econo the economy of Egypt itself, how it affected uh, the life of people, the inflation, high prices, um, uh, diminishing the activities of the uh, local uh, factories and uh, industrialization in Egypt. Also, on the other hand, the prices of goods coming from outside were so high relative to their income. So there was a sort of disbalance or imbalance between uh, the, the income of the people, the lack of jobs, lack of development, and the high prices, and also the goods that were really not essential for their lives, luxury goods. The open door policy opened up opportunities to acquire wealth, but wealth which was concentrated in very few hands. One of their favorite gathering places, the lobbies of the Nile Hilton when new alliances were formed between the new rich and the political elite, weaving a web between power and wealth, state and society. If in Nasser's time wealth was frowned on and had to be hidden, in Sadat's Egypt, being rich was flaunted. There was legal and illegal money in the forms of commissions and fees, and new Western alliances which came mainly in the form of banks, hotels, and fast food chains. They wanted to open all doors to everybody without any uh, systematic policy or uh, any defined objectives for the national economy as a whole. It was not uh, really the laws of the market, as in uh, the market economy. And of course, it was not uh, a planned economy. Then it was nothing, it was absurd. An American model, selling imported goods which most Egyptians can't afford and don't need. It's got to be really smooth, really smooth. One, two, three. 
بموت في الداليكو عايزة شوكولاتة ولا فراولة ولا بلية عايز كريم دوسي أحسن عايز كريم في الدنيا تدري من كاليفورنيا جري 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 عشانها بوم 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 I love Snoopy Snoopy loves me This was not what Sadat had in mind. His plan was that with peace, Arabian money, Western know-how, and Egyptian labor, he'd managed to bolster up Egypt's failing economy. But the Saudis and the Gulf sheikhs who didn't like his new peace with Israel wouldn't play. As for Western technologists who'd something to contribute to Egypt, the few who came soon went back. Jay Cosgrove, a well-known American architect and builder, is one of the very few American businessmen left in Egypt, and he's not doing all that well. My books show that I've lost some money over the four-year period. We're still scrounging. We're going to make it. But at this point, we're on the minus side of the ledger. That's all. About a half a million pounds. So why are you smiling? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to make it, eventually. Oh. Because the market here is unbelievable. Now the United States and the European community is pouring money in here, and this demand for housing is greater than anywhere else in the world. Cosgrove teamed up with Egyptian partners, as Sadat's law required, and went into business. But it soon became clear that it took more than passing a law to make these joint ventures profitable or even possible. What Sadat didn't recognize in his search for Western help was the difference in attitudes, in cultures. We have differences of opinion and different techniques in attacking these problems totally. And the way we handle that is just struggle along with the best compromise we can come up with because they own the equipment. So I cannot make them repair the equipment. I cannot make them do things they will not do. We have to clean these things up. We have to take those every afternoon and flush them out with water. Take care with the freezing and lubrication and keep the thing functioning properly. They won't hire good operators. Uh, and of course, they won't follow our uh, maintenance techniques. For instance, in a maintenance procedure, you would anticipate the, the uh, wearing out of belts and hoses and wires and so forth. And, it has a certain life. The manufacturer tells you what life it is. So you set up a schedule and you anticipate these things and change them before they break. Because if you wait until they break, then the machine is down for weeks and that costs you a great deal of money. They don't see that. They'd rather go fix it afterwards. Let it break. Other things were breaking too, like trust and confidence. Cosgrove's problem this week was that as far as he knew, no money had come in from the Egyptian client as it should have done. He called a meeting with his partners it only managed to highlight one more reason why such joint ventures failed. Between the different cultures, there was only a thinly veiled mistrust. <laughs> Have you been collecting any money? No. Just waiting. Just waiting. If we can produce three apartments per day, then we can get some money, if it's possible. Has Chicago agreed to give you any kind of a coverage for your overhead? Yeah, I agreed. Provided that we give him three apartments per day, as you promised him. All right. Yeah. As I promised as him. As you promised, yes. As we promised him. See, don't, don't make you, that differentiation. As you promised, because anyhow, we are following your instructions. Right. From no, the you're day not, we, we are, are we following are my side. instructions. If you followed my instructions, you'd get three flats a day. Well, if I follow your instructions, I don't get two per day. No, you would get the three. Problem, the problem is I, I, I have my own instructions on the other side. So that's why I'm, I'm giving a completely beautiful a target and good programs. Where is that? In other sites. Oh, other sites. Yeah. And this is the Which remain uh, nameless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And if you look at the evaluation of the open door policy in Egypt, you, 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 you find it is positive. See the number of banks which were opened here, the number of projects which are open here, the encouragement for the private sector to put their money in the open door policy is huge in this country. No matter if some corruption, so that we, we have to avoid the corruption, to, but to continue the open door policy in this country. The advertising signs of the company called Arab Contractors came to symbolize for many Egyptians much that was wrong with the open door policy. Rumors of special relationships came to haunt President Sadat. 
Arab Contractors is one of the largest companies in the Middle East, certainly the biggest in Egypt. I think we are the biggest by far, and the, the size of the next company after is one-tenth of our size as far as turnover is concerned. Uh, but really, uh, we have a big responsibility and a big duty towards Egypt. Still, they've done quite well by Egypt. Almost everything which is constructed in Egypt seems to have been constructed by Arab contractors. We build bridges, we build highways, we build factories, we build power stations, we build ports, we widen the Suez Canal. The big Aswan High Dam was built by our com company as main contractors. You name it and we build it. Arab Contractors is a nationalized company, yet half the members of the board are related by blood or marriage. Some of them are also heads of profitable private companies which do business with Arab Contractors. Other members of this financial family run million dollar joint ventures under the umbrella of the open door policy. A pyramid of wealth and power headed by the all-powerful Osman Ahmed Osman, a sometime minister in President Sadat's cabinet. It was no secret in Egypt that the two were linked by the marriage, if nothing else, of Sadat's daughter to Osman's son. By 1977, even his admirers saw Sadat as one of the haves, while over 90% of his countrymen belonged to the have-nots. In Cairo, over one million live in the city of the dead, Cairo's large cemetery. A city built for two million is now inhabited by 14 million, where every day hundreds of peasants arrive in desperate search for jobs and where 25% of the population can be classified as unemployed. Out in the country, nearly half the population is unable to support itself. Egypt can't feed its ever-increasing population, and the government must import vast quantities of food from abroad. The US provides the grain for one in every three loaves of bread baked in Egypt. The government has heavily subsidized wheat for years, as it subsidizes most basic food that Egyptians eat. Oil, maize, sugar. In January 1977, under pressure from the World Bank and the IMF to impose some financial discipline, the Sadat government slashed the subsidies. Within hours, the price of food rocketed. The cities erupted. In many cases, the rioters attacked what they saw as the decadent fruits of the open door policy. Night spots, imported cars, westernized shops. January 1977 was probably the beginning of the end for Sadat. In January 1977, there were these massive food riots that swept the whole country from Alexandria to Aswan. These riots were violent, were angry. Hundreds of thousands of people participated in them. And uh, they exposed in one dramatic uh, incident that the regime of President Sadat was in real danger, that he had turned his back on the majority of the Egyptians who are poor or lower middle class, and uh, had been basically more concerned about the aspirations and about the expectations of the upper middle class and the upper classes. Sadat refused to see it that way. Well, it was misunderstood, really. Who has benefited now from the open-door policy? The taxi drivers. Are they, uh, are they uh, rich or are they from, uh, I mean, uh, 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 a high rank or so in the country? No. Uh, uh, the laborers, all the laborers in various, uh, in various places here and in various uh, uh, um, work here, uh, uh, all, all those has benefited from the open door policy. It is not like they say that uh, uh, there, has, uh, there are millionaires here and so. No, not at all. This is pure, uh, uh, pure uh, um, uh, um, black propaganda from the side of the Soviet Union and his agents here in the country. Instead of understanding the riots of 1977, which were massive, as they really should have been understood, 
He blamed them on outside agents, agitators, communists, uh, thieves, thugs, and did not pay attention to what was really happening in the society below. The society below was a fundamentalist society, fiercely jealous of its traditions and proud of its cultural heritage. Egypt had always considered itself the center of the Islamic world. Now it found that Sadat's policies were alienating other Arab countries. It was painful. His importation of Western ways and customs was jarring, sometimes intolerable. Small events accumulated into damning evidence of the apparent decadence of the Western-inspired system. The ordinary person in the street, when he saw on the television President Carter kissing uh, Sadat's wife, they were so angry. Women in, in uh, the mind of uh, the, the Egyptians are something very untouchable. You see, when things come to women, uh, there is another thing. We speak another thing, you see? Mrs. Sadat's championship of women's rights, a Western concept, didn't endear her or her husband to a fundamentalist, male-dominated society. The divorce here for the Muslims are very easy to divorce their wives. And this is what I don't like at all, and I am fighting for this, and I believe I will uh, reach it one day and soon. <laughs> Her examination for a university degree in Islamic and English literature, taken with the full publicity of national television, her husband in attendance and the whole nation watching, alienated the fundamentalists. It also embarrassed the educated, who muttered about a new Evita. The most in social Some of the most widely publicized of Sadat's activities seem natural to American audiences, but they angered many Egyptians. The Sadat family's favorite charities. Egypt, once the capital of Arab nationalism, is having a love affair with the West. The latest embrace was for Frank Sinatra, his longtime support of Israel, just a forgotten detail. There were fashion shows and museum tours in the three-day benefit held to raise $500,000 for a Cairo rehabilitation center sponsored by President Sadat's wife, Jahan. It attracted donors from Australia to New York. Most paid more than $5,000 for three glittering days and nights on the Nile. Few Egyptians attended. Chicago, 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 my kind of town, Chicago. When Sadat assumed power, there were no veiled women in Egypt. By the time he was dead 11 years later, there were hundreds of thousands. The veiled women of Egypt, this is their answer. By veiling, they're answering all this avalanche of American commercialism, of the Western, or the attempt at Westernization, the cocalization of Egypt. Their veiling is a rejection of the lifestyle brought about in the 70s and was probably uh, magnified or symbolized by Mrs. Sadat. So this is her answer. It's a cultural uh, downplayed answer of an attempt for cultural uh, authenticity or assertion of cultural authenticity, saying, yes, we would like to be educated. We are not against modern uh, science or modern technology, but we are going to do it our own way without having to appear Western or to take uh, after Paris or London or New York. It's from among these young women and men, the university students, that Sadat's assassins came. There were 24 accused. They were all students or university graduates. Only two were over 30. Uh, 
the typical Islamic militant, the angry Islamic militant, who would uh, probably go all the way as to kill a leader, a political leader in Egypt, is typically young man. He is a university student or a uni recent university graduate who comes from lower middle class, who is probably from originally from the countryside or from a small town, but who is currently living in a big city like Cairo or Alexandria. Most of the young Islamic militants are also high achievers. They are in elite uh, colleges and majors and professional schools. So they are among the most dynamic, the most intelligent of Egypt's youth. The type that we are concerned about, the people who killed President Sadat, uh, have used religion as a banner for expressing their political misgivings uh, and for expressing their socio-economic grievances. But in terms of their background, in terms of their problems, their grievances, they are not really much different from the majority of youngsters of their uh, background and class. Uh, they share with probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, the same grievances, the same problems. And that's why it's only a matter of weeks or months before any one of these youngsters that you meet in the streets of Cairo or Alexandria, uh, with the profile I just described, could be turned into a, uh, an underground Islamic militant. Sadat undoubtedly had his struggling people in mind when he hobnobbed with the leaders of the West, hoping that a Western alliance, economic aid and peace would bring the needed relief to Egypt's problems. You can say one thing, that he was concentrating more on foreign affairs than the local affairs. You can say this. But he was with the idea always that once the foreign uh, matters are solved, so this is going to reflect on the people inside, either in the cities or in the villages. My people are very patient. One of our characteristics here in this country, we are very patient. But all the signs show that in a very short time, let us say two or three years to come until 1980, we shall be uh, really, uh, uh, if we continue to work on this rate of work, uh, I think we shall be uh, uh, starting the takeoff uh, at the end of 80. Abla and Ahmed have been engaged since 1979. Three years later, they were still looking for somewhere to live. My problem, I want to marry, only. I want to get married. Peace, no peace, American. Peace, no peace, American, no American. Saeed works in one of Egypt's largest newspapers, Al Ahram. He's a writer and a political researcher. Like most of his friends, he's the beneficiary of NASA's policies, which offered free university education for all. The result is that there are 40,000 new graduates every year and very few real jobs for them. So the government creates jobs, jobs which pay between 40 and 65 Egyptian pounds a month, 20 to 30 British pounds. Saeed's wife, Ahsen, is a set designer, but she's unemployed. So Saeed must work till the small hours of the morning, doing whatever comes his way, translating, writing and editing. But money, much as it's needed, is not his only preoccupation. Money and the freedom. Uh, there is no difference between them. Freedom for me is a very, very important thing. You know, this is a matter concerned to my life itself. I'll tell you something. I'm working at Al Ahram from uh, about uh, three years. During the, oh, the whole period, I wrote many articles, many researches and so, but I wrote, uh, I didn't write in fact one word about Egypt. I wrote about Israel many, many times. I wrote about uh, Lebanon, you know. I wrote about all these uh, matters, but about Egypt, I said I, I haven't written really a, a, a single word. This is, uh, of course, uh, very, very sad for uh, anyone like me. It's sad for most journalists and writers who can't write freely in Egypt. 
The more Sadat was idolised by the Western press, the more he seemed to crack down on his own. When he appointed the editor-in-chief, and before the job of editor-in-chief to publish, but in his regime, the editor-in-chief is to censor. I mean, we uh, as editor-in-chief used to write for millions, but the new editor-in-chief was writing for one man. If it is a story that the president likes, it is headlines. If a story he likes it a little, it's a three-column story. It is his like, uh, you know, not very much, it is inside story. If the president doesn't like, it's not published. Not that Egyptians were used to a free press. For 18 years before Sadat, Nasser exercised tight censorship. But Nasser was a hero and a self-avowed dictator. Sadat's problem was that he said he was a democrat. The result of that period that we were in prison, all of us. <laughs> so he spoke about democracy, but uh, there's a big difference by speaking and doing. It's a matter of comparison between the security of the country and what's so-called democracy. So he preferred security to the, country, to the country at this main point, and he appealed to the people to say their, their opinion. So he took democracy, we, he tried to find a formula between the democracy and the security of the country. All the freedom for all the human beings. No dictators, no dictators. Death for all dictators. On the day of the sentencing, after a secret trial of which nothing was published, one of the accused stood up and hurled his grievances for the world to hear. He spoke directly to the Western press that he knew were on the far side of the courtroom. Ironically, the free press had presented Sadat as anything but a king. Friday morning at a tiny village, 10 miles out of Cairo. The president of Egypt comes to join the village people at prayer. Sadat is clearly at home among his people. He seems genuinely uninterested in the outward trappings and rituals of high office. His faith is deep but simple and it brings him close to those he rules. It was the small town boy made good, the international statesman who'd remained a villager at heart. This was the image the press presented and the Western world loved it. The Egyptians saw a different image. Sadat was acting as a monarch and uh, what, you call, what uh, you call in the USA the imperial presidency. And he was this imperial presidency, you know. He was using uh, 50 uh, different residents in a small country like ours. Since I was three years old, I walked on this same road. American television was particularly intrigued by the American legend of the president who'd made it from the log cabin, this time in Egypt. <laughs> I used to sit here as one of uh, 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 those two men. Egypt, Egypt, the son of Egypt, the god of Egypt, the uh, earth of Egypt, and everything about Egypt. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to extent that, that makes uh, one uh, uh, shy and uh, to say that, if somebody is talking to you too much about honesty, what, what will you think about him? He comes to you and says, look, as an honest man, I say this because I am honest. And honesty uh, uh, forces me to do this and that, uh, as all honest people like me. And it, it is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, prostitution. 
Good evening. Not since the founding of the modern state of Israel. Not as it was perhaps know. difficult for Sadat to stay tuned in to his small country when he was linked by satellites to the whole world, his every move followed and heralded by the world media. Egyptian President Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Begin. It happened this way earlier today in CBS News interviews with the two leaders. If you get that formal invitation, uh, how soon are you prepared to go? Uh, uh, really, I, I'm looking forward uh, uh, to fulfill this visit uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the earliest time possible. He hinted uh, to me this morning that he thought it might be possible that he would be going to Israel if the invitation was forthcoming within a week or so. Do you think that's realistic? Very good news. Good evening. This is Cairo, on the eve of modern diplomacy's most daring venture. The American media did more than just report the event. At times, it played an active role in it. Even before the plane touched down in Israel, Barbara Walters told ABC viewers what Israeli leaders would learn only the next day. Prime Minister Begin has said that they are willing to talk the principles of peace with you. They are willing to talk specifics and substance. Are you willing to do this? Sure, for sure I am willing to do this. If they are ready, I am ready. The love affair with the Western media, which began in Jerusalem, would continue long after it. Through American TV networks, Sadat became a more familiar figure than any contemporary world leader, projecting a warm human personality. Well, believe me, Walter, I am in a dilemma. I don't know, will he be uh, coming to, re to take his uh, responsibilities in the Western Bank or so, or will he be wavering or so, I don't know. But today, did your husband say to you, I think we're going to make it, I think it's going to work out? Oh, yes, 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 I can feel it really. Walter, I shouldn't like to, uh, this to be taken as an ultimatum or so, but I have uh, 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 I have explained the whole matter to President Carter. This is a fine man. It wasn't just television. Newspapers and magazines joined in. The American and Western press are responsible for spoiling him. He believed what they said about him, and he acted like a pharaoh. And the Egyptian people didn't want the pharaoh. The Egyptians felt that policies were announced to them from lofty heights of pharaoh-like posters, and they became his policies, not theirs. His dreams, his ambitions, his peace. Too often, his words were aimed towards American ears, not theirs. The United States holds in its hands more than 99% of the cards of this game. In Cairo, the words were jarring. And there comes Sadat after the first war that we have ever sort of felt refreshed after, which was not a, a, a defeat and things. And he just comes and says that 99% of the cards are in the hands of America. Well, that leaves 1% for the whole lot, the whole world, you know, the Arabs, Israelis, United Nations, Europeans, Japanese, the whole lot. So that leaves us Egyptians probably 0.0001% or something. And uh, what could be more of a defeat than that? You know, when 99% of your destiny is, is being decided somewhere at the White House or the Pentagon or somewhere in the world, you know. American TV noted it all to the second. Let history record that at 11 and a half minutes after two this afternoon, Eastern time, Egypt and Israel had a peace treaty. The handshake that electrified the world did not electrify Egypt. What is Egypt? Egypt to, to a person who's who can't read, who doesn't know very much about the world and the Israel and whatever, whatever. Egypt is home, uh, food, transport, people. I mean, it's not just a few lines drawn on a map. Uh, and just look at it. 
What does Egypt mean? It's, it's, it's not just this abstract concept. Why not give every person his little Egypt before telling him live for Egypt, die for Egypt, Egypt first, Egypt above all, Egypt above everything. But the Egyptians did not get their little Egypt. The promises were not delivered. The expectations were not fulfilled. In the time they were ready to allow him, Sadat's policies did not pay. And there was restlessness. It all came to a head in the summer of 1981. The demonstrations against President Sadat have been building up for some time. This weekend, the president's formidable security force moved in to detain religious leaders. Opposition newspapers were closed down and journalists and politicians detained in a sweeping operation that was the best indication of the seriousness of the opposition. The president, though, is unrepentant. It is a purge. When he arrested 1,500 people in one night, I thought this is the end of him. He signed his death warrant. An Egyptian wrote, he lived like an American president, and sadly, he died like one, on television. Cairo is calm today, surprisingly, extraordinarily calm. The people show none of the emotion that might be expected on the morrow of one of the nation's greatest tragedies. Allah!